Mr. Bader, are you ready, sir? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a special meeting of the Gallup, emergency meeting of the Gallup City Council for Monday, April the 13th, here at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, this meeting does have our uh, council here, and we are live streaming through Google Handouts Meet, so welcome to any of you that are out there in the public. Uh, observing this meeting we also have city staff here in the council chamber and we are practicing our social distancing uh, mr. beta councillor Palachek here councillor Shaw here councillor Garcia here. councillor Kamara you will need to unmute your phone councilman Kamara and mayor McKinney here so ladies and gentlemen, for the public to know, there are uh, four of us council present and uh, here live, and then Councilman Kamara is on the phone. We are gathered today to discuss one action topic. It is ordinance number S2020-3, an emergency ordinance establishing a curfew for individuals and businesses and to ban the sale of alcohol by certain outlets to aid in stopping the spread of the COVID-19 virus during the period of the declared emergency by the state of New Mexico. Uh, I'm gonna invite Mr. Hayes up to explain the potential ordinance. Uh, Councilman Kamara, we're hearing background noise on your phone. If you could remute, we would appreciate it. Mr. Hayes, city attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor and councilors, um, I want to walk through this ordinance, but I want to talk a little bit about um, what's been going on over the weekend. Um, I've been working with Doug Decker, uh, the county attorney. We had been working back and forth all weekend because we were, to the extent possible, trying to have what the city was doing and the county being consistent. And there's basically three um, substantive sections of this ordinance. Let me interrupt you real quick, Mr. Hayes. Are you going to... First, if you could tell us the results of the county meeting, or I have it in front of me. That's simply. what, exactly. I'm okay. going to start with what happened at the county meeting this morning, and then I'm going to walk through um, the specific issues that I think you need to consider with this particular ordinance. And so um, there were three things that we put into the proposal that went to the county this morning and the proposal that's before you this afternoon. Um, the first one is in section three, which is a public curfew. And so the public curfew would be um, other than um, folks that are under one of the exemptions, that generally people could not be out and about in the city between the hours of. I want to apologize again, Mr. Hayes, just to, to be uh, transparent to the entire city and anyone watching it. I want to welcome our new counselor from District 2, Mr. Michael Schaft and let the public know that Mayor-elect Louis Bonaguidi is in the audience uh, for comment later on if he so chooses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and so, <clears throat> again, the first substantive section is a public curfew, um, which, again, it basically provides that unless you are within one of the listed exemptions, and they're fairly um, lengthy, that you could not be out and about in the city between the hours of 8 p.m. in the evening and 5 o'clock in the morning. The second substantive section is that unless um, you are a, an essential business that really needs to be open after 8 o'clock in the evening, um, that, you needed, that businesses needed to be closed between the hours of 8 p.m. in the evening and 5 a.m. in the morning. And um, let's see. Yeah, we'll get that in a second. And then the third substantive section is section five, which is the alcohol sales restrictions. And so in section 5A, you have a um, restriction on dispenser licenses that is, in fact, something that's already been imposed by the Secretary of Health uh, pursuant to the governor's order, which basically prohibits packaged liquor sales. The one that um, the city and the county had, or were looking at, or Mr. Decker and I were proposing, was a limitation 
on convenience stores, and we have a definition of convenience stores, that would be any uh, dispenser licensee that has less than 4,000 square feet. So that was the three substantive sections that Mr. Decker and I were proposing to both the county and the city. Um, the county, as far as the curfew, uh, made that a voluntary curfew. So it's basically saying that they are encouraging people to observe a curfew, but it is not mandated. The second section, as far as the closure of businesses during the curfew, um, was eliminated by the county commission. That is not part of what passed the, um, the, um, the county commission this morning. The third one on alcohol sales restrictions, uh, section A, the one that deals with package liquor sales, was left in the county's proposal, I believe. But um, with section B on convenience stores, um, they came up with pretty much a totally different alternative, which was that their proposal prohibits the sale of hard liquor by any licensee, and they defined, they set a cutoff, which is 15% alcohol, and you know normally it's by volume is what they say on the, on the, on the bottles when you read the when you read um, how much alcohol is or whatever it is that you're consuming. And so generally wines are in about the 12% level, 10 to 12% level. Um, beer tends to fall into about the 4 to 5% level. Um, and you know, hard liquor, if you're looking at, yeah, 80 proof is 40% um, alcohol. So they're banning the sale of, of um, basically anything other than beer or wine during the, the period of this public emergency. And as I understand, and Mr. Mayor, correct me um, if I'm wrong, is that that um, ban that was passed by the county commission is not limited to just convenience stores. It, I think it involves anyone that is a county alcohol distributor, but to my knowledge, they only have four venues within the county out of the city limits. Correct. But I think, I think that they, the way that it, what finally passed, was a ban on the sale of any alcoholic beverage which has a percentage of alcohol higher than 15 percent no matter if you're a convenience store or a grocery store or a you know, by all dispensers that is, is correct and that is on their copy i have the copy of their ordinance that they approved this morning okay um and so that's basically what happened in the county is that what passed is uh, very different from what was proposed at the beginning of the meeting. And certainly that's within the prerogative of, this, of the county commission, and today will be within the prerogative of this, the council here to do whatever they want with this proposal. This is just a starting point for you to decide uh, what you want to do. So, you know, we are in some uncharted territory in a lot of ways. And so normally I would not talk about the things that are in the whereases, but our whereases serve basically the same function that um, in Congress they have what's called legislative findings, um, which are what are the things that the uh, Congress finds to be true that is the basis of this legislation. And so, um, you know, we have an entire page of whereases because I think that we need some, um, some factual support for some of the things that we're doing because of, of the seriousness of this, um, of this um, COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic. And so we've, we've in here, we've talked about all of the things that the Department of Health has done so far including some of the things uh, regarding alcohol sales, like banning the sale of packaged liquor. Um, we've also talked about the fact that um, municipalities basically have a duty to protect uh, the public health, and we could do things which are expressly prohibited by law, and, um, and that uh, we think that a curfew and restrictions on, on businesses would eliminate, or not eliminate, but seriously reduce the number of unnecessary social interactions that um, you know typically in our society most business and work is done during the daylight hours 
and it's the nighttime hours when you have social interactions that really are not necessary. And that's what we're trying to reduce with some of these proposals. Um, and, and then another thing that, that Gallup uh, deals with is that we have a significant population of uh, folks that do not have a uh, current address, they're homeless. And uh, many of these folks have a problem with alcohol abuse. And they very often are congregating in groups that are not observing the social distancing uh, requirements of the public health orders. And a lot of times the, the glue that holds those groups together is their consumption of alcohol. And so that's why um, alcohol is addressed here. This is not an attempt uh, by uh, the city of Gallup to um, interfere in, to deal with the, the alcohol problem that we have. It's, it's an attempt by, hope, well, hopefully it's an attempt by the, the um, city council here to reduce unnecessary social act interactions by people who are engaged in behaviors um, that really increase the risk that they are going to be transmitting the COVID-19 virus between themselves. And so going to the second page, we've got some, con some definitions here that are significant. Um, convenience store is a uh, significant definition because we know that um, typically where our homeless population is purchasing alcohol is at convenience stores because they sell alcohol in small volumes that are affordable. Um, person means a natural person as well as business entities. So one of the things that if there's non-compliance that we would need to look at is who needs to be the defendant in a case if we're going to court? If someone at a convenience store, for example, is violating the prohibition against convenience stores selling alcohol, who is it that we cite? Do we cite the corporation that has a policy that's allowing that to happen, or do we cite the clerk who happens to be working that day and sold the alcohol? So I, I put in a definition person that would allow us to um, to proceed uh, with citation against probably who's really the responsible party, which is the company that's making this decision to ignore um, any kind of restrictions that may be imposed by, by this council. Um, <clears throat> public three, or section three is a curfew. And um, you know there is a lot of debate um, out there about whether curfews are in fact an effective way to um, to deal with the, um, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and again, uh, you know, the logic of curfews is that a lot of social interactions that are unnecessary are committed um, in the nighttime hours. And so um, what was uh, proposed, and this is uh, something that we would not be the first to do this. There's um, some other uh, cities and counties, Taos, for example, um, adopted a um, declaration that allowed their, I, I believe it allowed the city manager to, to actually set the hours. But um, we've, we've kind of followed some models here as far as the hours of setting a curfew that begins at 8 p.m. each evening, continuing until 5 o'clock the following morning that requires people to not be out and about um, in, in, in public. And so there's two areas of, of the public that we're talking about. One is public areas that are owned by, um, by a government entity, you know, like a park or something like that. But a lot of public interactions is parking lots. Um, you know, those are not owned by a government. But we, so we've included a definition, privately owned land that's traditionally open to the public, such as places of business malls, parking lots, campgrounds, and recreational facilities. And it could be other privately owned property. And it doesn't matter if you're in a car, on a bike, on foot, you are not allowed to be out between 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning. A lot of people need to be out for, um, for legitimate reasons. And, and so I've tried to come up with a comprehensive list, but um, there may be other um, categories of people that do in fact need to be out and about that, that you may think of that I, I didn't think of. 
So at the bottom of page two, the following persons shall be exempt from the curfew while in the conduct of their official business. And so we've come up with a, a, a list here of uh, persons employed by a governmental entity. Uh, pretty much anybody who's employed by any governmental entity that um, is on official business, they're not just you know, on their own time, anybody employed by any governmental entity that is in the conduct of their official business is allowed to be out between the hours of 8 o'clock in the evening and 5 o'clock in the morning. So we've, we've included a list just for example of the types of people that might be out and about. But certainly that's not a comprehensive list and the way that it's worded it says personnel employed, employed by any governmental entity. That's going to include any government employee by federal, state, local, tribal government is allowed to be out. So um, exemption number two is um, personnel employed by a governmental entity or private entity engaged in providing um, the following list of services. So again, we, I've tried to be as comprehensive as possible, um, but um, for example, one of the things that I um, didn't think of was logic. And so um, the latest proposal that you have um, includes uh, personnel that, are, that are, are employed by somebody who's engaged in logic. They're allowed to be out and about. So you might have somebody that's going to work at 10 o'clock because they work at, at the Comfort Inn or something like that. Um, and so number three is um, it says that not only are you allowed to be out and about while you're on the job, you're allowed to be out and about while you're going to and from work. That's just kind of a, a logical one. Um, but on the other hand, you can't be um, making side trips. If you're going to be out, <clears throat> if you're going to be going to work at 10 o'clock at the Comfort Inn, you need to be going directly to work. Um, so you need to be taking the most direct route between the two locations. Um, you might have at 2 o'clock in the morning, you wake up and you're having some sort of a panic attack or something, you need to go to the, the emergency room. And so that's what uh, 4 is about, that if you're traveling to or from a hospital um, or a health care facility or you have an animal that's in critical need of, of attention, um, or, and I tried to put a catch-all in here that said, if you're doing anything, that is necessary to prevent the loss of human or animal life, injury to persons, injury to animals, or significant damage to property. And so I think that is probably going to cover any kind of emergency situation that might arise. You know, if you're trying to protect life, property, and um, uh, you know animal life, and that's why you're out and about that ought to cover pretty much any reason that somebody might legitimately out and about. And then, of course, uh, we have an interstate going through town. Obviously, if you're driving from Los Angeles to Chicago, we're not going to set up a roadblock at 8 o'clock and not let you come through town because you're violating our curfew. And so I have an exemption here that um, if you're driving through town, you don't live here, um, you can drive through town and you can stop and buy gas or whatever um, but um, that's all you're going to be allowed to do. When you say it. whatever, if there are fast food uh, facilities open late in the evening, naturally they're providing a vital essential item as food. Correct. Okay. And, and so one of the things we'll talk about, it says that um, persons that do not reside in Gallup that are traveling through Gallup on an interstate or state highway that do not leave the highway except to obtain one of the products or services listed in Section 4B. And so 4B um, lists um, all of the businesses which are allowed to be open between the hours of 8 and uh, 5. So it's going to be you know, all kinds of health care services, vehicle fuel, and um, food or fast food if, as long as there's a, um, a drive-through window. Um, or a curbside service. Those are the only things that you'll be allowed to. You know, those are the traditional things that somebody traveling through um, would want to have. Um, 
you know, something that just popped into my mind again was um, that we may need to put something in here. Um, what if you want to stop and stay in a hotel here? Um, I just, that just occurred to me. Um, I don't have something in there on that. So uh, we might need to, actually, I'm thinking the most current version, did somebody have, this is I, not the most current I version. I thought I'd stuck lodging in there. I don't see lodging and I don't see food service. Oh no, you do have no, lodging. Three. Okay. You do have lodging, but we need to include the fast food service, uh, drive up food service, even for the public, if this curfew is enacted, that if at 10 o'clock at night, say a McDonald's or another fast food service is open, they can go to their drive through pick up food and go back home. Okay. Well, there should be um, in section three, um, so we've got section 4B3 on page, what is that, page, got it. page four, we do have a, a um, fast food one. Okay, good. And so um, I think this was, I think what I'm working off of is the second to the last version. So in, in section 4B1 on the top of page four, um, after the word shipping delivery services, um, is the word lodging in there? Yes. Okay. Okay, I did insert it. Yes. Okay. And then for B3 has the fast food restaurants or drive up. So you are covered. Okay. Now, another change that I made in the um, last version was um, section 4A. Um, commencing immediately upon the effective date of this ordinance and continuing thereafter each day until the governor revokes the declaration of a health emergency contained in Executive Order 2020-004. All businesses and nonprofit entities, um, is there some language in there in the version you have about that provides uh, products or yes, services that provide products or services directly to consumers? So what my thinking was there is that you might have businesses that uh, remain open. I don't know if we have anybody that fits into this category, but let's say you had, a, I don't know, a factory that was producing widgets and they were running in the middle of the night. Um, they're not going to be having unnecessary social interactions. They should be able to continue to operate. Or you might have a, a sorting facility or something like that, you know, a shipping company that was doing sorting like a, a, you know, a UPS center where they collected all the stuff they had that day and they're just sorting it for where it's going to go out the next day and they're doing it at midnight. Is that a problem? And I don't think it is. And so that's why I asserted that language about um, that are providing uh, products and services directly to the public because that's where you're getting those social interactions that are problematic. Um, and so we've, we also have, <coughs> excuse me, we also have an exemption for vehicle fuel. Now, there's two different kinds of facilities that sell vehicle fuel typically. You know, we don't have the old-fashioned gas stations where that's all you do is you buy gas. Typically, you're going to buy gas at either a convenience store or a truck stop. Um, the problem with convenience stores is um, that you get, again, a lot of, the, of our homeless population. Um, are buying alcohol there and, and not engaging in safe behavior. But they're also small. And so there's just a lot more potential for um, close encounters. And so, but on the other hand, people need gas in the middle of the night. And so what we've tried to do is find a balance here that says that um, if you're operating a convenience store and you sell gas, we're okay with you selling gas but you can't be letting folks into the store. The rest of the store needs to remain closed. Um, so they can't be selling other products. Now on the other hand, truck stops, um, you know, deal with a different clientele because typically they're gonna be selling, um, the majority of their fuel is gonna be interstate truckers. And um, those folks need services other than just to buy gas. If you're um, you know, traveling from, again, you know, Chicago to um, Los Angeles in an 18-wheeler, you need to have some of those services available that truck stops provide. 
And so, again, this is something we actually borrowed from the uh, proposal that the county had that they ended up eliminating was this truck stop exemption that says that if more than half of your sales are coming from diesel fuel, that not only can you continue to sell fuel, you can also continue to remain open as long as you follow the um, social distancing requirements that have been imposed by the New Mexico Department of Health. And um, one of those requirements has to do with the number of people that are allowed within the retail space. So the Department of Health order, the latest Department of Health order, said that um, what the way that you calculate how many customers that you can have in your store <coughs> is that you look at the occupancy load, the normal occupancy load that um, is calculated by the fire marshal. And so for businesses within uh, Gallup, we have a fire marshal, we actually have three now, who do, who do that calculation. And then um, you're allowed to have 20% of whatever that number is as far as customers. Um, and then the third one um, that um, is in here that again um, was borrowed from the county is the fast food and restaurant exception. Um, so what you have as a proposal is that fast food and restaurants that have a drive up window or curbside pickup service are exempt from the business closure, closure curfew, however they must be uh, in compliance with the Department of Health, um, uh, 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 Department of Health social distancing requirements. Now, the issue that I think uh, that you need to consider with fast food restaurants is, are they kind of an attractive nuisance in the sense that um, we're telling people that you are to remain at home between the hours of eight and five, and you get a craving for a Big Mac at twelve o'clock. Um, are you going to drive down and get a Big Mac even though you're violating the curfew? And so I think the, the issue is uh, with fast food is that what's the, what's the population that could legally be utilizing a fast food, um, fast food convenience? Um, and it would really be uh, people that are out on the job like police and fire and those kinds of things and um, people traveling through. But, uh, you know, just regular old folks that are living here in Gallup that work during the day should not be going to McDonald's after 8 o'clock at night if this is the proposal that you adopt. And so I, I think that's something that you should consider and discuss is um, whether or not this, um, uh, this exemption um, is problematic or not. Well, we're getting it <clears throat> into uncharted territory a little bit is with Section 5. Section 5 is the alcohol sales restrictions. And um, again, as I mentioned previously, there are two parts to Section 5. Number, the Section 5A is the part that um, <clears throat> states that anybody who holds a dispenser license. Um, and so a dispenser license, we have a, a, we have a somewhat odd um, the way we categorize liquor licenses in New Mexico is, is different than most states. We have this kind of catch-all license of dispenser licenses, which is anybody who sells what we would call hard alcohol, hard liquor. Uh, no matter what the mode of selling it, a convenience store, a package store, a restaurant, um, a bar, they all collectively have this thing called a dispenser's license. And so um, what the um, New Mexico Department of Health order said is that um, basically package stores um, are, are shut down because the way that um, her order reads is that unless that dispenser uh, derives more than 50% of its gross revenue from the sale of food, non-alcoholic beverages, water, dry goods, and other consumable household products. So what you're looking at there is um, grocery stores and convenience stores is who is exempt from the Department of Health's order. So in a sense, <clears throat> in a sense, we're really just duplicating 
what's already being done by the New Mexico Department of Health and presumably is being enforced by the New Mexico State Police who's been assigned to enforce her orders. Um, where we're um, stepping out a little bit is in the convenience store section. So let's walk through this one. Convenience stores that hold a dispenser license, which would be any convenience store that's selling alcohol, um, may not sell, <coughs> serve, or otherwise transfer beer, wine, or other alcoholic beverage, um, as those terms are defined by the New Mexico Liquor Control Act, at any time of any day of the week until the governor revokes the declaration of health emergency. So let's talk about what that means. You know, what we're telling uh, convenience stores is that you can't remain open 24-7 to sell anything except fuel. So between the hours of 5 a.m. and 8 p.m. In, um, in the evening, you're allowed to remain open, you're allowed to, to have uh, your doors open and have customers come in as long as you're observing those, um, those social distancing requirements in the 20% rule. Um, and so between the hours of 8 p.m. in the evening and 5 a.m. in the morning, again, if this proposal passes, Section um, 4 would basically say, you're not going to sell anything except fuel. And so they're not going to be selling lottery tickets or, or milk or alcohol or anything. So what we're talking about here is sales between the hours of 5 a.m. and 8 p.m. In, in the evening. Now, <clears throat> and if we were in normal times, um, this proposal would be problematic because um, basically there is a um, regulatory scheme in the state of New Mexico which tells cities and counties what they're allowed to regulate as far as alcohol sales. But we're not in normal times. And so uh, the legal question is um, the fact that we have um, these declarations from the governor. And so let's go back and look at the whereas's here. Because I think that's important. That um, the governor issued a executive order and based on the executive order, the um, Secretary of Health has issued a number, I think she's had three or four public health orders um, that have been issued pursuant to um, several laws, the Public Health Act, the Public um, Health Emergency Response Act, the All Hazards Act, um, <coughs> and one of, one of the, um, uh, the, the, the um, second to last public order that she issued on April 6th provides that um, her order does not restrain or preempt local authorities from more stringent restrictions than those required by the order. So, um, you know, the argument that's, that if this were uh, a court case would be because these are not normal times, because of the seriousness of the health risk that we have the authority to, that that, that basically trumps the Liquor Control Act. And that, um, that um, things like um, the Secretary of Health's order is telling us cities and counties, you need to go out there and look at what kinds of restrictions are going to make sense in your particular um, situation. And that, as you know, we have some unique situations in Gallup that allows you to do some things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And so, um, you know, uh, Mr. Decker had the same question asked of him this morning about, um, you know, what's the legal basis of this? And, and I'll tell you kind of the same thing that Doug said, which is, um, you know, in normal times, um, we couldn't do this. But the argument, again, is going to be that these are just such extreme times that the governor and um, the secretary of health have at least impliedly given us the authority to, to do some things that we wouldn't normally do. 
And so let's talk about why that's important in this particular situation. You know, what we have in Gallup is a situation where you have people that, and anybody, I've seen it, I'm sure you all have seen it, that you're driving around Gallup and you're seeing individuals who are clustered together, um, clearly not absorbing any kind of six foot uh, social distancing requirement. They're just hanging out and they're passing a bottle of liquor amongst themselves. Where are they getting that alcohol from? Well, they're, typically they're going to be getting it from a convenience store. And so um, you know, one of the things that, um, that needs to be, I think, considered and discussed is you know, this, this um, restriction does not say that um, alcohol can't be sold. It's saying that you can't get it from a convenience store. And um, so you're going to have to get it from Safeway or some, something that's bigger than 4,000 square feet. And um, typically that is not where that population is buying their alcohol. Now, will they begin doing it? Uh, possibly. We don't know. And if that comes to pass, then maybe we need to, to come back and consider um, further restrictions. But initially, uh, the discussion among staff was that um, convenience stores are where we're having our issue with, um, with the population that is um, at high risk. And we know because we're, we're dealing with the, um, the hospital, Rehoboth, and any health service, and, and they're seeing a pretty high percentage of this population is testing positive. And, um, and so once those folks that are, that are positive as far as the uh, COVID-19 virus are out on the street, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be back interacting with each other and um, spreading this uh, virus in a, in a logarithmic fashion. So penalties. Um, one of the things that, you know, typically violation of a municipal ordinance would be a fine of up to $500 and or up to 90 days in jail. Well, um, we know that um, jail populations, um, it, that's a problem with as far as you've got a lot of people in close confinement. Do we really want a judge to have the authority to send somebody to jail for violating this ordinance? And so this proposal has a different penalty scheme than you would normally see for violating a city ordinance. So it's a misdemeanor to violate, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a misdemeanor for any person to violate any section of this ordinance. And so remember that a person, again, is not just the clerk who sold that alcohol, um, or who violated the curfew. It could be a business entity. It could be the corporation, the LLC, the partnership, whatever it is that's, that's making those decisions. And the penalty is going to be a fine of not less than nor more than $500. Now $500 is our maximum fine um, under New Mexico law. Another thing that you typically see in um, ordinances where you have violations that are kind of continuous is that we make every day a new violation. And so if you've got a um, person who is um, uh, violating our land development standards or a whole you know, uh, fire code, we have provisions that basically say every day that you ignore our law, you can be charged with a new violation. And so that's what I inserted into this. So if you have somebody who is uh, a company that is basically ignoring our restriction for two weeks, that's going to be potentially whatever, 14 times um, $500 or $7,000 fine. Um, now, there may be situations where, you know, a $7,000 fine may not be a sufficient deterrent. And so, the last sentence here says that we can um, do other things. We might want to go to district court to get an injunction to order that somebody not be violating uh, or continue to violate. Um, and this is that's kind of standard language that you'll see that the, that we um, also 
retain our right to um, go to district court for what's called equitable, equitable relief. Now, one of the, <clears throat> one of certainly the, the uh, provisions that got a lot of discussion among staff is the curfew. So, um, who should be enforcing this? Well, um, I think that code enforcement officers and fire marshals um, are the kind of people who typically enforce this kind of regulation. Um, and so I included basically three groups that have the authority to issue citations. Our police, our code enforcement officers, and our fire marshals. Um, there's a, a case from the New Mexico Supreme Court that says that um, if the only penalty is a fine, you shouldn't ever arrest somebody. So um, basically what that's saying is that if you have a citation that's issued to someone um, and they refuse to sign it in the old days for a speeding ticket or whatever, you'd arrest them. Um, you can't do that anymore. And so we're basically just following the, the guidance from the New Mexico Supreme Court here by saying uh, people shouldn't be arrested um, ever for violating this ordinance. Um, the curfew. And again, this, this one got a lot of discussion. And the question is, do we want police officers um, stopping people and asking them whether or not they are out there on official business or not? Um, that's a concern. Um, and so, you know, remember when seatbelt laws first got passed and a lot of states um, adopted what was called secondary enforcement for seatbelt laws, which basically was the, the idea that a police officer in this state cannot stop you because he sees that you're not wearing a seatbelt. He can only stop you if you committed some other traffic violation. And in that instance, then, he can also issue a citation for the seatbelt violation. So um, a proposal that you have um, that um, I thought might limit, uh, allay some of the concerns about police officers being a little overly uh, aggressive in stopping people just for being out after curfew was to do something similar with this ordinance. that basically says as far as the curfew is concerned, it's secondary enforcement. That if you're out driving um, and you're not committing any traffic violations, a police officer should not stop you simply to make sure that you are um, legally out and about. However, if you commit a traffic violation and the officer pulls you over, he can start asking you about, well, why are you even out at 12 o'clock at night? Do you have legitimate business? And if the person is not within any of those um, exemptions that allows them to be out and about, then the officer could issue a citation. So again, that's one of those things that, um, you know, we, we just make a proposal for you. You need to consider whether you like it or not. Uh, but it would restrict um, enforcement of the curfew. So any, any enforcement officer shall not initiate contact with any person uh, or place any person into investigative detention for violation of section three unless the officer has reasonable cause to believe they've committed a violation of some other law. So this is not talking about, again, just cars. This could also be pedestrians. That officers should not be just out there um, asking folks that are walking down the street, why are you out and about at 12 o'clock at night? Um, unless you're violating some other portion of the law. Um, We also put in here, um, or I put in here, a um, something is similar to um, what we do with some violations in our animal code, which is that your first violation, you get a notice warning. And, the, and kind of the logic behind that is that um, there's an education process that's gonna need to be, um, not everybody is gonna know that we have a curfew. You know, not everybody reads the news. 
and not everybody watches television, um, there's going to be folks who don't know there's a curfew. Is it fair for them to be cited for a curfew violation when they didn't even know? And so that's why we put into effect this, um, this warning process, that for the curfew, um, you won't be um, cited for your first violation, you will be given a warning. And then, of course, that will be, um, we'll need to work with Metro to establish some sort of database so they keep track of who's been issued a warning and can then receive a citation. Now, the other provisions, like the um, closure of businesses and the restrictions on alcohol sales, um, there's no, um, you get one get out of jail free card on those. We're assuming that businesses um, should be aware of what the law is. They should be keeping track of what the law is. So um, I, that is uh, a lot more um, detail than I think I've ever given you on an ordinance, but I think because this one is uh, so much different than what we have typically done that it needed uh, a lot more explanation. So with that, um, I stand for questions. Mr. Hayes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on a couple expert witnesses so this council can hear the opinion of our fire chief and our police chief. And uh, then this council will open up to questions for any and all of you. What I want to do is present some facts of why we are here together on this declaration of a public health emergency. We have positive cases reported among city staff. We have a few employees that are quarantined to, uh, that have been exposed and they are quarantined and we have people that were tested positive. And what we do know over this last week or so that the social distancing has proven to work. As of last night, we had 144 positive cases in McKinley County with 700 cases approximately on our surrounding Navajo reservation, both New Mexico and Arizona. What we have done and worked with through a task force for the last two weeks uh, with our chiefs and with our city staff and with the hospitals and emergency care, uh, we have developed a way to isolate some of the people that had no home to go to. As of last night, we had 78 people that we, through the hospitals, directed into motel rooms. Currently, the El Rancho, the Motel 6, and Howard Johnson's are housing 78 people. I don't know how much that number is changing today, but these are 78 people that had no way to self-quarantine, and they are being quarantined currently. So with that, I will ask uh, Chief uh, Morales if you would give an opinion on the, uh, what you think our current status is, what we're thinking about, where we're going. You're free to talk either on the curfew or the alcohol ban. And please introduce yourself for the public to hear. Yes, good afternoon. I believe it's afternoon. Chief Morales with the Gala Fire Department, Mr. Mayor and Council. You know, my opinion, I believe our city attorney, uh, Mr. Hayes, you know, said this repeatedly in unnecessary social interaction, and that's what we're still seeing out in the streets, unfortunately. You know, at this time, uh, it's a dire situation out there with community spread. Community spread is starting to accelerate at this time, and we need to do everything we can in our power to kind of minimize that social distancing. As far as the alcohol, uh, banning the alcohol piece, you know, I think it's, it's very important that we look at all sites, and I know there are some concerns from our physicians that that banning alcohol, which we're not doing, we're banning from convenience stores, but minimizing or reducing alcohol to some of our transient population who are alcohol dependent is going to cause other medical conditions, withdrawals, and potentially take up rooms at our, in our hospital. So that's something to consider. It's, there's no easy decision item. I, I wish I could provide you with better information to, to help you um, to make that determination. But I can tell you, you know, alcohol plays a big role in, in what we're seeing now with community spread because the social distancing isn't working in, our, in, in that community. And 
you know, I feel that having a curfew that helps keeping the loitering down, keeping people moving, is something that we do need to help minimize that spread, at least within the, for the next you know, couple of weeks or whatever that may be. So with that, I, I stand for any questions. Chief, once again, I'll bring up Chief Boyd, and then this council can digest everything and bring back questions to any of you. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, Chief Franklin Boyd, Police Chief Boyd. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Chief Frank Boyd, uh, Police Department. Um, Mayor and Council, in regard to this pandemic, I will tell you right off the bat that uh, this pandemic has created a whole new set of very challenging issues in law enforcement. We're turning to into some waters that are very uncharted at this point, and we're trying to work out these challenges within our department. I mean, obviously, we have a duty to protect the public. We have a duty to protect these individuals who are homeless. And on top of that, we, I have a duty to protect the officers that are out there on the front lines dealing with these, these individuals. So from that perspective, I will start with uh, the curfew. Um, as we all know that our department is, uh, is, is a small department compared to the size of the visitors that we have on a monthly basis. So talking from that perspective, I will say that we do not have the manpower to conduct traffic stops and everybody coming into the city. It's just not possible. Um, not, on top of that, we have exemptions for people who can be out in the public, even if this curfew has passed. So I agree 100% with what Curtis, our city attorney, stated earlier, Curtis Hayes, in regard to we won't be randomly checking people who are just out on the streets. But coupled with a lawful traffic stop or a lawful, det or a lawful detention for a person out on the streets, Yes, we're going to look into our, the violation first, and then, of course, question why they're out during curfew hours. So um, I think that's the right approach if this uh, ordinance be passed. Uh, in regard to the pros and cons from the law enforcement perspective for the curfew, um, I will tell you that obviously our homeless population within that group, there's a pandemic within the pandemic with this group. It's, it's, it's very challenging to try and uh, get them to comply with these Department of Health orders that are meant to protect us all. Not only them, our officers. So with this curfew, in my, from my perspective, as a, as a pro versus a con, if we can alleviate the number of contacts we have with the public at large, we can concentrate our efforts and our focus on this pe on, on this population that are uh, are uh, out and about contributing more to the spread of this virus than those who are not. So it goes without saying, the less contact we have with one another, the less contact our officers have with anybody, including our own selves, it's, it, it'll mitigate the circumstances from my perspective. So if we pass this, if this curfew passes, I think it can only help from that perspective. But again, like I said, we don't have the manpower, nor do we wish to set up checkpoints to restrict anybody from coming in within the city. We don't, we don't have the manpower, and that's, that's not our focus right now. As far as the alcohol uh, restrictions, I've, I've heard a couple of comments, and, and I've been asked a couple of questions. What does alcohol have to do with this pandemic? So I'll paint uh, a circumstance that we've been running into on a regular basis. Um, so when we respond to a call for service where we have individuals that are passed out, calm down and out, we're limited with what we can do with them, especially now. We obviously have an issue with aggressive panhandling. Now couple that with some of the restrictions we're facing now, in regard to what we can do with these people when we have to take custody of them. Our options are, are limited. We can take them to NCI, but NCI has reduced their capacity now. On Friday night, they were at capacity and we couldn't take anybody over there. Obviously, they're complying with the uh, social distancing directive. So that's an issue. If a person needs medical, medical attention and they're passed out in the streets, it's our protocol to take them to the hospital because obviously it's a medical issue. When we do that, we tie up our ERs 
and our nurses who are already busy as it is and they don't have the room on top of that. So what's our third option? Our third option is to take them to jail, uh, whether it's a disorderly conduct charge or, or any other charge associated with why we're there. It could be a shoplifting charge. Our jails are being very, very restrictive on who they're allowing us as police officers to book. We have to go through a screening process, a question and answer process, and they're taking their temperatures. Um, a good majority of the people we're trying to formally book into jail are being denied. So that creates the final challenge to us. What do we do with these individuals when all of these entities are at capacity as law enforcement officers, we're not medical professionals, we're not there to detox them, nor are we there to incarcerate them. So when, that, when these entities are at capacity, what are our options? Well, we don't have any options, that's the issue. So we try and find a place to go, try to calm them down, and maybe uh, some treatment by EMS will suffice if, if the ERs are, are at capacity. So that's the nexus I'm trying to paint in regard to what does this restriction of alcohol have to do with this, this virus. Well, there it is. So in regard to reducing the, the alcohol or re restricting alcohol sales, I can tell you anything we can do to limit the, the problem we're facing with these issues when we have to deal with uh, homeless, intoxicated persons or disorderly who are passed out on the streets or need medical attention. We are at our limits in regard to what we can do. As we all know, we already have an issue with aggressive panhandling, people uh, passing out in the streets, um, especially in, in the wintertime. We have a whole unit just dedicated to try to save the lives of people out left out in the weather. Now, couple that with this virus. It's a very, very, very challenging for our officers, our public service officers. So anything we can do to mitigate those circumstances, I mean, I, we're overwhelmed and we have no place to take these people. So limiting the sale of alcohol, um, it would help us a lot. In regard to the other uh, grocery stores, uh, yeah, they, it, it, from my experience, and I've talked to my commanders this morning, they have good security. So even though they may be allowed to sell alcohol, their security is, 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 uh, is adequate. We don't necessarily go over there because um, people are buying alcohol who shouldn't be buying alcohol. They do a good job screening people out in regard to who they sell alcohol to. They have security, that's the key. I can't say that convenience stores have security as much as they do. They, 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 they did a good job. Um, Walmart has security. Uh, I believe Shop and Save has security. So they're a big help in, in this regard. <coughs> So with that being said, Mayor Council, um, I stand for any questions, and uh, and uh, I'll just say this, that we, we need as much help as we can possibly get dealing with this issue. Thank you very much, Chief. Yes. We, uh, Mr. Hayes, you have another comment? Well, yes, I just need to interrupt. We have a, a huge problem. Um, we're not getting a feed out to the public, and um, that creates a serious legal problem. Because in New Mexico, we have an Open Meetings Act that says that the public has a right to attend and observe um, what we're doing here. And we haven't provided that for them. Um, Did we restrict so, attendance to this meeting? Did we say no one can come? I believe we restricted we uh, physical attendance. And what we provided for, or we we're hoping to provide for, was that we would meet the legal requirement that they can observe by um, a feed that we are that uh, isn't working and so bottom line is if we take any action at this meeting it will be invalid mm -hmm. let me ask a question um, and so what we need to do is um, um, reconvene um, at a date and, and we're thinking for we, we're pretty confident we can get something done by tomorrow and get and maybe reconvene tomorrow yeah because it's streaming live but it's not Okay, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, with our IT department, do you feel that we would be online by tomorrow? The, the public could hear? And we certainly don't need to restrict public attendance here. We need to restrict the amount of public attendance as long as we're doing our 20% social distancing. So, Chief Morales, if you feel that if we re-advertise this through Mr. Veda 
and uh, if we did have, we might could fit five or six uh, civilians in here at the most, but we could allow. Uh, and then we definitely want to be able to go online, whether it's, if it's video, it's great. If it's only voice, so be it. But as long as the public hears what we're discussing. Um, I just, well, just an issue of whether that, I, I'm inclined to think that this, this topic might um, attract a pretty significant public interest. Um, I mean, just throwing it out there that, Okay. Um, well, I think you've kind of told me. just having electronic, because we're not going to be able to have physically everybody here who wants to hear what we're talking about. So. Mr. Archuleta, do you have a time that you think would be that we could comply and be back on tomorrow? Uh, let me check. Let me make sure first. Okay. I want to make sure could we? Mr. Beta, yes, could we officially? Uh, close this meeting and resume tomorrow uh, based on whatever time Mr. Archuleta comes up with yes, and put the public notice out today so that the public can be informed of our discussions. Yes, sir. In council, I don't see that we, we have lots of questions. I know we all do for the city attorney and both of our chiefs, but I think we should refrain from uh, answering any questions so the public can hear the ask and hear the answers. I uh, agree. I agree, but I have, a, I have a comment. Is there any way we can, could consider using the Amoro to have an actual council meeting and allow the public to attend? There's more seating. There would be a way that we could do the social distancing. Uh, Mayor and Councilor uh, Palachek, the problem is the governor's public health order restricts social gathering to five. Oh. So we could probably say under the exemption for our essential local government services that staff could be there, but no more than five in the public. What about the 20% of capacity of a... That's for retail establishments. It doesn't apply to mass gather gatherings. Okay. Okay. I thought, just thought no, it was got you. That's a good idea. Since we're, we're not in an official meeting, yeah, I'd like to look at that real quick. Uh, just, uh, well, you're talking about the theater, right? Yes. Let's I mean, look at that option. And yeah. we're, we're told by the Secretary of State we must have these meetings. We must allow the public in. And we could social distance quite a few in there. So it may be something. The county did do their meeting this morning, and they did it virtually, so they didn't have technical difficulties, and so it worked for them. And there is actually a March 17th order from the state that kind of governs how virtual meetings should take place. We attempted to do that, but unfortunately we had technical difficulties. But well, the city attorney will look at that, but I think it would be a bad example to have a mass gathering. Okay, I'm gonna go straight to council. Uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion to recess this meeting until such time is given to us by the city clerk working with the IT department, hopefully to resume tomorrow. So, so moved. Second. Yes. Yes. Councilor Garcia. Yes. Councilor Kamar. And Mayor McKinney. Yes, and Council Kamar, thank you so much. Hopefully, I'm gonna ask our IT department if he can create that that call-in phone where people can be on the other other end, but where they're all muted, at least we could uh, audio would go out if we can't get the uh, Zoom streaming working. Uh, we want to make sure we're available to as many of the public as we can be. So, with the action of this council, we are in recess until such time that our city clerk puts out the notice for our next when we regather. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.